Welcome to series four of the Public Interest Technology PIT Colloquium. We are delighted to be hosting this series and have an engaging program lined up. My name is Roba Abbas and I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Business at the University of Wollongong, Australia and the Socio-Technical Systems Technical Committee Chair at the IEEE. I'm joined today by my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, who is the Director of the Society Policy Engineering Collective in the School for the Future of Innovation in Society at Arizona State University and the Editor-in-Chief of the IEEE Transactions on Technology in Society. Katina and I would like to acknowledge Melissa Waite and the events team at the College of Global Futures at ASU for their support of this series. Before we begin and introduce our speaker for this session, I would like to take a mo moment to reflect on our colloquium to date. We journeyed from Series 1, which focused on values, responsible innovation, and COVID-specific technological responses, onto Series 2, which centred on storytelling, imagination, and participatory design methodologies, then to Series 3, which emphasised the global perspective with respect to the social, the regulatory, and the ethical considerations relevant to the design, development, and delivery of technology in the public interest. In this series, we illuminate a path toward transdisciplinarity, hosting international speakers who will share with us their perspectives on topics such as experts and expertise, innovation ecosystems, multi-stakeholder approaches, and the opportunities and challenges relating to, the, to addressing complex societal challenges. In this session, we'll be hosting Professor Roger Clark, who will present on the topic Beyond the Business Case, Multi-Stakeholder Risk Assessment, followed by reflections and questions from my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, and our guest panel for today, Ms. Yvonne Apollo, Dr. Jordan Schunher, and Associate Professor Rob Nichols. For our live attendees, please feel free to note your questions, comments, and reflections in the chat throughout the presentation. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Roger Clark to the PIT Colloquium. Roger Clark is a long-standing consultant in the strategic and policy implications, policy impacts and implications of transformative and disruptive information technologies. He continues as a visiting professor in computer science at the Australian National University and in law at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. His research publications include highly cited works in many aspects of data valence, identity and privacy, and his pro bono work includes over three decades on the board of the Australian Privacy Foundation. Professor Roger Clark also served on the advisory board of Privacy International and variously as a director, secretary and chair of several companies of Electronic Frontiers Australia and of the Internet Society of Australia, including as its secretary from 2012 to 2015. I could say so much more about Roger's many contributions, both here in Australia and internationally, but I will hand over and welcome Professor Roger Clark. Thank you, Roger, for joining us. Thank you very much uh, uh, for that, Rober, and uh, good morning, everybody. Um, let me just carry on from uh, Rober's introduction to my to my general background, um, so that I can talk about my motivation here. Um, I've uh, been in the IT industry sufficiently long that I started out back in the day when we used uh, punch cards and printouts, and we didn't have any interactive uh, interface to computers. Um, and then we gained visual display units uh, without intelligence, but with display and with a keyboard. Um, and th then we moved on from there, all within an intra-organizational context. So just inside one organization. Um, over time, of course, that changed and changed quite significantly because we crossed organizational boundaries. We've moved out to inter-organizational systems in chains and in networks. Uh, subsequent to that, we moved into what I call extra-organizational systems, where as an information system goes beyond the boundary of one organization, but it also reaches out not just to other organizations, but to individuals in their own right, in their homes, and these days, of course, on the street. So um, with that has come an enormous change in the power uh, of systems and the amount of delegation that organizations and humans grant uh, to systems. So we now have automated inferencing, we have automated decision-making, and we've got an increasing degree of, in many cases, ill-advised uh, automated action uh, in the systems that we've got. 
Now, given, um, given that context and given my perspective on that context over many years, looking at strategic and policy implications of, uh, of uh, all sorts of uh, technologies, uh, I'm concerned that we aren't doing very well because uh, benefits exist, benefits are not necessarily evenly shared around the various um, people and organisations that are impacted uh, by technologies, and collateral damage is rife and getting worse. So we need to do something about that. And I'm going to look first at some of the ways that we've used in the past and propose that one particular approach that hasn't really been looked at much in the past um, should be uh, improved upon in order to serve this need. So with that preamble, um, I start out in my logic, in my analysis of this by um, declaring that the field of view I've got involves obviously socio-technical systems because uh, um, we have to um, have a broad view of the complex systems that we're dealing with. And we have to recognize that those systems exist within an environmental context and they have impacts in the short term and implications frequently much, much harder to, uh, uh, to work through, think through and understand uh, implications over the longer term. And the kinds of interventions that people try to make into this are now complex. It's no good just thinking about uh, people um, uh, installing a computer-based system to automate an existing, uh, existing manual process. We could do that in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, we can't think like that anymore. Uh, a great many of the interventions that we, uh, uh, that we uh, impose on socio-technical systems have many different strands uh, that are making up the or giving rise to the impacts and implications Various forms of regulatory framework exist. Uh, there's existing in institutional infrastructure, uh, both uh, not just technological, but the uh, nature of organisations, the relationships between them, the ways in which laws and norms uh, affect their, their behaviour, uh, and business processes, which uh, are the ongoing or, or generate the ongoing activity. Um, all of those things uh, are changed and are imposed because that's that's how we uh, achieve benefits um, uh, and achieve greater change in society. So I'm looking at interventions in the broad. Now, because of my, my perspective and, of course, the context that we're in here, uh, innovation in society, um, uh, I'll always be coming back to interventions that have got substantial uh, IT uh, involvement um, in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in the process. Now, there's a number of other um, aspects that we need to think about here. Uh, one of the uh, look, I'm not terribly big, despite having the word professor floating around. I'm not terribly big on theoretical framing, uh, but obviously there is some in the background. And one of the single most important uh, elements of uh, framing is uh, to think about stakeholder theory in the briefest possible way, um, since everybody is uh, doubtless uh, well aware of the background of this. Uh, the notion of stakeholder theory is relatively young. Well, I think it's relatively young. It's younger than me, um, uh, 50 or 60 years old. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it was created because the predominant thinking uh, in business schools had always talked about shareholders uh, for good logical reasons. The joint stock company is the basis of so much innovation. Um, it was recognised by some theorists, however, management theorists, that um, that's not all there is to it. There are other parties who have an interest in what's going on and have had for many, many decades. Uh, so the notion of a stakeholder was created at that time. Obviously, the word existed previously. It came out of, out of betting rings, uh, uh, which have been around for millennia, uh, but it was a useful word and it's a counterpoint. Now, in the sort of context that we're talking here and that I'm interested in, uh, the IT um, uh, supported arena, um, we certainly think about users of information systems as being stakeholders. Something that we frequently overlook and which we've been trying to get people to think about a lot more for the last heavens, seven knows, 25, 40 years, uh, is what are usefully called UZs. UZs are people or indeed organisations that are impacted by an information system or any kind of intervention, even though they are not themselves participants in it. So they can't be referred to as users. It doesn't make sense. Uh, the most obvious are uh, the, um, I'll, I'll use it in a case study later today, um, uh, the family members of an individual who is a user of a system and who is badly affected by it, or indeed well affected by it, uh, they are UZs. They are not themselves directly involved. 
Now, the theory was then developed further by some other people, and they said there are different attributes that uh, stakeholders have. One of them is the amount of power they have. And by power is meant the capacity to affect the achievement of the system's objectives. Um, and legitimacy is the extent to which uh, they, uh, well, various definitions, uh, the extent to which uh, those people have a genuine claim is distinct from merely asserting one, and urgency is to uh, um, the um, um, extent to which short-term activity is needed to, to deal, with the, uh, deal with issues. Um, an important take home from this is more recent work and more critical work about stakeholder theory and practice which says that sponsoring organisations commonly, and I'll use the term sponsoring organisations for the organisations that drive an intervention, um, sponsoring organisations typically consider stakeholders only to the extent that those stakeholders have power, unless they can affect project success, unless they can um, uh, cause, uh, well, should we say, avoid adoption or obstruct adoption, uh, unless they have that kind of power, they are generally overlooked and even then they are only looked uh, on or the interests are only looked upon as being constraints on achievement of the uh, sponsoring organization's objectives. They are not seen as having objectives in their own right. Um, and that exists in, um, uh, in bodies of theory now as well as in practice. As a practicing consultant, I've seen this time and time again where I've been trying to guide a client and trying to get them to see things from outside the organization's view, and it's remarkably difficult to achieve that, uh, uh, achieve that breakthrough. So that's an important framing, um, uh, framing uh, body of theory uh, with practical implications. And then, of course, we can model stakeholders in social systems as, as, we, uh, as we wish and recognise that there are many different users. And I've not modelled them uh, quite as, in quite as much detail there, but also users who are also affected by these things. So... As to what I'm proposing today, my proposition is that we should pick up an existing uh, process that is used uh, in business and government, um, and which many people in business and government are familiar with, and we should turn it from being a single stakeholder, effectively shareholder, if you will, in a corporate context, uh, from a single organisation uh, um, assessment method to a multi-stakeholder method. And the purpose is to achieve a practicable mecha mechanism, get through to organisations, speak to them in their own terms and get organisations to adapt rather than having to adopt something new um, into their business processes. I'll come back to that a little later. So quick recap, now that we've got some momentum and now I will um, stop being ponderous, I hope, uh, and move more quickly, um, having laid the groundwork. There are many techniques that are used by organisations to evaluate um, the kinds of potential interventions that they're considering. Um, some of those are concerned with quantitative data uh, because business likes numbers uh, and a lot of those numbers uh, of course are dollar uh, type numbers um, and uh, without bothering to go through these things um, uh, each of these has varying degrees of legitimacy from within an organization's own context um, and then there are some which move beyond the quantitative data to variously called non-quantifiable or qualitative data and um, uh, cost-benefit analysis is used within organisations, uh, perhaps more so within government organisations, but it's certainly uh, used by organisations. Uh, always, however, uh, from the predominant perspective of the organisation itself. And then there's risk assessment, which I'll deal with in later slides. Um, there are techniques that have a broader frame of reference than uh, just the organisation's uh, individual interests. Uh, Cost-benefit anal analysis is, a, is uh, developed in the economics um, um, discipline, and it is a broader uh, notion than just an internal one. It does or can take into account far more perspectives. Um, technology assessment, which was huge in the United States uh, back in the 70s, 80s, uh, and unfortunately uh, was subsequently trampled upon, by one particular president, uh, president um, but is still alive and well in Europe. Uh, it is a somewhat diffuse way of looking at an individual technology. So if, you, if we take as uh, the Internet of Things, silly, silly title, but that's what people call it. If we look at IoT, 
it's scattered across an enormous range of applications. It comprises an enormous range of subsidiary technologies within it. Um, so you end up with a fairly diffuse understanding, but nonetheless, some valuable insights into, into um, uh, what might happen in different contexts because of a new technology. So it's not necessarily what we need as a technique for studying um, a particular intervention that uses probably a combination of different uh, technologies in multiple different ways, um, quite specific to the context. Uh, so it's not perfect for, for what we're looking for here, valuable though it is. And so on with a range of other impact assessment techniques, which take um, external perspectives, not just internal perspectives. These don't ignore the um, interests of the sponsoring organisation, but they don't necessarily make those interests predominant. So there are these around, but they're not in practice used very much by individual organisations. And there's a very good reason for that. Uh, having practiced and continuing to practice as a board director, chair, secretary, I'm um, um, very much aware of the fact that the law all but precludes me from taking into account the interests of other stakeholders apart from the organization of which I'm a director. Uh, now, depending on the jurisdiction you're in and depending on interpretations of the law, it may be an exaggeration to say I can't, but I've got to be very careful how I do it. Um, uh, clearly, small scale donations to look good uh, with a public relations benefit, they can be justified. The further you move into compromising the um, approach that the organization in its own best interests needs to take, the further you move to compromising that, the further you are moving towards breach of your your obligations as a director. So there's good solid reasons why these evaluation techniques um, are stunted in within organizations. Now, I'm going to move on to risk assessment. I'm going to whip through a few slides here, reminding people, because I'm sure many of you only need reminding, uh, not, to, not to tutoring. Uh, risk assessment is a tool used within organizations as part of their evaluation technique. It uses um, implicitly or explicitly a thing that I refer to as a security model, a conventional one. This is very heavily used in IT security and data security, but it has much broader application and international standards uh, apply beyond just IT. Um, I've never seen anybody else use um, a diagram quite like this, but it lends itself very easily to diagramming. So um, um, desperate for getting something other than bullet points on my slides, um, I occasionally draw uh, the odd diagram. So the logic is that there is the notion of a generic threat. Think lightning. And that can give rise to individual threatening events, such as a single bolt of lightning which may impinge on or may exploit, the verb depends on the context, some kind of vulnerability. Now, in this case, we're thinking about a church steeple with a loose rock on top of it. Uh, and if the bolt strikes that vulnerability, it may dislodge the rock. That dislodging of a rock would give rise to, rise to a security incident, um, and that could lead to harm to an asset, such as a serious panel damage to a vehicle uh, underneath the parapet. Let's leave people out of this at the moment. Let's stick with a car. Now, it's a very simple, um, uh, straightforward model. Now, um, the threats that are involved here, uh, so back at the top of the diagram, the generic threats and the threatening events uh, are typically categorised. Uh, we've just used an act of gods or nature um, in the form of lightning, but there are accidents that involve uh, typically people or perhaps artefacts, and there are attacks where there is intent uh, uh, for um, harm to arise. Uh, so there's all sorts of analyses that then that, that then can be pursued right the way through um, uh, each, uh, each of these elements. Now, stakeholders, as we've already uh, talked about, uh, play a role in this, and it's a role that is very often overlooked by organisations in their mainstream conventional uh, security model thinking. Where stakeholders come in is that stakeholders perceive assets differently. They may even perceive assets that aren't perceived by the organization and the kinds of values they have and therefore the kind of harm that could be done to those values um, will depend on that stakeholder and their perspective. So for the model to be sufficient and to fulfill the purpose that we're after here, you have got to model that stakeholder inside the um, security framework. Thank <laughs> you. 
Of course, there's much more to it than that because there are safeguards, some of which already exist by accident um, uh, and some of which are specifically designed by organisations. Uh, the, the safeguards are of various kinds. Uh, the word control is used in some of the theories, um, a very bad word, it has too many meanings. Uh, so the word safeguards are much more appropriate. Some of them are deterrent, uh, trying to um, uh, uh, dissuade lightning from striking a uh, uh, striking a steeple, uh, trying to dissuade attackers um, um, by threatening them with all sorts of nasty uh, outcomes for themselves. Uh, there are safeguards that prevent events, that detect events when they've happened so that prompt reactive action can be taken by an organisation, and safeguards that reduce harm. Mitigation measures is the common term we use for the ones down the bottom, the bottom most of those three red arrows. So there's quite a quite a body of um, of theory, and bear in mind this is this is practical as well because it's established in standards. It's built into many organisations' business processes. Um, so we're um, um, down to a level of actual impact uh, in in the real world with uh, with this kind of model. Um, it's not just floating around in academe. And the last element of this, which of course gives rise to the term risk assessment, is the notion of risk, which is a slightly complicated one. Um, it is a perceived likelihood, or in some uh, theories, a measure of the perceived likelihood that harm will arise to an asset as a result of that series of things. So that's the sense in which uh, in which risk is used here. They've tried to make it um, um, uh, make it. Uh, bring it down to earth, so to speak. Um, I use a little example here about perception of risk, uh, because perception is important. It isn't necessarily an accurate measure. Um, and there's bodies of theory, uh, some of it uh, really abstruse, uh, which tries to nail down actual risk, uh, whatever that means, as distinct from perceived risk. But let me, let me give you my example of perceived risk, which people sometimes like. Uh, tourists in Australia um, perceive risk uh, to themselves arising from, uh, in different orders, depending on the individual, crocodiles, snakes, spiders, sharks, and jellyfish. We've got lots of them. And some of every one of those are deadly. Um, and um, they see that as being what is going to put them at risk when they are touring around Australia, particularly in the outback. Although <clears throat> sometimes redback spiders are actually uh, in your own backyard. But... Um, well, actually, you've also got to watch out for the other ones because kangaroos, emus, cassowaries especially, and even wombats um, are actually quite dangerous and can uh, cause a lot more damage, particularly to your vehicle, um, but even to you, than those other things, which very, very rarely happen. And guess what? The real danger to a tourist in Australia is from horses and bees. Um, if you actually look at the statistics, way more um, injuries and deaths from horses and bees than from all of those other things put together uh, every year. So uh, perceived risk and actual risk uh, have to be thought through in a particular context. Now, risk is all very well, but why are we doing this risk assessment? We're trying to work out what the residual risk is, what isn't already covered by the safeguards that are accidentally, incidentally, or on purpose, but just common sense uh, safeguards, um, given all of those that are in place, what's left, despite existing design features, existing safeguards and existing mitigation measures. So uh, that's what risk assessment is all about. Now, there are many models. There's international standards around the place, uh, um, as, as always. The great thing about standards is you've got so many to choose from. Um, and there are packaged versions of these things that used to sit on shelves, but now, of course, they sit in PDFs on, uh, um, and in um, uh, Word formats uh, on people's, um, well, in the cloud now, <laughs> used to be on people's disks. Um, this is a generalised one which suits my um my purpose um, as you'll see in a few slides time but it is a reasonable representation of the way in which um uh, or an underlying model um that exists for all of the existing mainstream forms of risk assessment risk assessment is the analysis phase the top half of, of that diagram um, and it then leads on to the so what what do we do as a result of the risk assessment the risk management design and the risk management implementation in the second and third phases um, now, you'll see that 1.5 through 1.9 in the middle um, are um, uh, direct applications of the security model that I referred to earlier. Uh, 
Um, that is a slight difference. It's often not quite as clear in some of the uh, some of the um, uh, documents you see where consultancy firms try to make it seem more complicated and more highfalutin and make it seem as if they've value added. Um, uh, I've made them quite explicit because, because I think it's helpful to do so. Um, so that's the, take that as the standard mainstream uh, risk assessment technique used in organisations. What am I proposing? So we go back to the purpose. The purpose is to find a practical mechanism by adapting that existing risk assessment technique so that the interests of relevant players above and beyond um, the uh, organization itself can be drawn into the assessment and um, the approach we're going to take is to adapt not uh, adopt new or propose um, a new ways and unduly new ways of doing things and just go back one step here to where some of this work came from uh, because this works really quite recently over the last several years um, uh, many of us have done work on this certainly katina and certainly roba has as well as me and i'm sure others of you have done the same thing we've looked for ways in which artificial intelligence can be replied uh, applied responsibly by organizations uh, how can we um, incentivize them uh, and to the extent necessary um, how can we impose regulation on them to ensure that they do um, take care with a very dangerous technology and propositions uh, in my papers have put that responsible application is only possible if stakeholder analysis is undertaken and their interests are understood by the people making the decisions about the design of AI, application of AI. Um, and uh, for risk assessment processes to reflect the interests of stakeholders, it's got to be broad, not narrow, and uh, the um, uh, multiple stakeholder groups need to be drawn in uh, or their interests at least need to be appreciated and included in order to complement the interests of the organization itself now all of that's in papers that precede this current work uh, what uh, what this work is doing is to generalize that and here finally um it's only been 28 minutes uh, 26 25 minutes so that's not too bad uh, the the real point the the, the guts of this uh, uh, proposition is on this slide Let's uh, start on the right-hand side, the protuberance out to the right-hand side with the red blocks around it. Uh, the proposition is that those things 1.4 through 1.9 need to be done by multiple stakeholders, by and or on behalf of multiple stakeholders. And that needs to be done in parallel with the analysis that's already being done by the organization. Secondly, to enable that, 1.3, the description of the intervention, needs to take into account the fact that other stakeholders will be reading the document and going through their processes at the same time as the organization. Now, that matters to an organization because there's some things that you don't actually want to spread around society uh, and particularly not to spread around particular stakeholders. Um, uh, partly uh, the way that things are expressed inside organizations uh, can sometimes be seen as being demeaning um, if you are reading it as a stakeholder. Um, sometimes it will disclose information which is which has security implications. Often it will contain information that the organization will fear has security implications. Uh, often uh, they're spurious uh, concerns, but uh, the organization has them nonetheless. So there's uh, a document needs to be written with the intention that it be sufficiently informative, not excessively informative. So there's a point of difference uh, that organizations, adaptation that organizations will need to go through and consultants like me will help them do that um, because that's how we um, help um, oil, <coughs> oil the wheels of progress, we think. Then down at 2.1, the results of each of these parallel assessments needs to be drawn in and assimilated somehow. And that's very important. It's got to, there's got to be a degree of integration. Because the organization is going to carry on and do this. The stakeholders aren't going to be in there designing the system and implementing the system. It's the sponsoring organization that's going to be doing that. So there has to be this integration step. And then at 2.3, when the alternative approaches, the alternative designs, the kinds of safeguards, the kinds of mitigation measures you're going to use um, uh, in the intervention, when that um, is being evaluated and decisions are being made, those objectives of stakeholders, and the constraints that these will represent on the organization's freedom of uh, freedom of action, they need to be accommodated, they need to be reflected uh, in what happens.
There is a further one right down the very bottom where I'll float the interface here between the, uh, the notion of there's this gentle notion of adapting an existing organizational process and the much broader, very Scandinavian seeming notion of stakeholder participation in design and implementation. There is a potential interface here. This is a much, much bigger step for organizations to take and many, many organizations do not like the idea. Some organizations, it's mainstream, but uh, uh, a lot of organizations uh, are, are very resistant to that idea, but it's, it's in, in the discussion area, it's not actually essential to the success of MSRA. Multi-stakeholder risk assessment can have significant payback with or without uh, the stakeholder participation in later phases. That slide merely repeats, uh, consolidates um, the important features that MSRA has. So I think I'll skip over that in order to be able to finish in some sensible time frame. Now, that's been 19 slides on a body of theory and the motivation underlying the body of theory. New body of theory, I don't want to use the word original, but, but it's new in the sense that it's an adaptation to something that currently exists. It's in many respects the bleeding obvious, but it's not out there being used. So it needs to, this is something that needs to be said, I propose. Um, so let's do some tests here and let's think about practicalities. Now, by definition, a new process, a new and adapted form of business process um, that hasn't been seen before, um, uh, there aren't any case studies, there isn't any real world that, uh, that we can observe to find out what its impact is. We're trying to get to that stage. So we've got to use proxies for, uh, uh, for real world. Um, the first thing that I've done is to look through uh, to see whether there are exemplars of any of this kind of thinking in any existing systems out there. Uh, does it already happen or do little bits of it already happen? And there's actually an awful lot that you, that you can find where there's evidence of, of this kind of thinking. Clearly, environmental impact assessment is the most mature of these areas, thanks to Rachel Carson et al. from the 50s onwards. Um, and the second of those bullets, access to mineral ore bodies, the example I'm thinking of there um, is where there's involvement of indigenous people on, uh, on native reserves. Um, a different uh, that's an american terminology we have other terminology here in australia for, for similar sorts of things um, and that will also necessarily involve environmental groups at the same time uh, as the indigenous groups so and there are there is evidence of, of some of this kind of involvement being done um, each of these other ones the fourth bullet inherently dangerous or intrusive interventions i'm thinking about medical implants and the reason for thinking about those is that there is a very large regulatory environment. There's very widespread recognition by uh, the people who develop these things, the invention and the innovation process and the testing processes. It's completely understood that there's an awful lot of stakeholders involved and a lot of care must be taken. Uh, so there are elements of this all the way through here. Um, the platform-based business sector, the last one uh, I've got in there, because if we think about um, the impact of the digital, digital surveillance economy, as I call it, um, uh, the new business model that's been in use since about 2004 or five, when Google got cracking, um, um, Google, Facebook, and in a different context, Uber, um, have... Um, all been drawn into this argument, dragged screaming into this argument. Uber has resisted it mightily and is having to learn its way into discovering that there are stakeholders whose interests need to be taken into account. Um, and um, you can see elements of it, even in case studies uh, with, the, with the tech platforms. So yes, um, there, are, there are signs there. Uh, there is, um, this is not a redundant um, project. This is not a waste of time. There's much, much more to be done, but it doesn't look completely unworldly. The second thing that we've been doing in here, I've been working with uh, Katina and Roper uh, quite specifically on this uh, in the last month or two. Um, uh, we've done a case study. Uh, we've had our eye on this for some time. Um, it's probably world famous by now, not just famous in Australia, um, the RoboDebt case. And I'll quickly whip through the context, the narrative and the outcomes. And the purpose is to find out would multi-stakeholder risk assessment applied inside the relevant organisation have made a difference to this absolute disaster of a government project. 
The context was that a very large welfare benefits administration agency, it's not a policy agency, it merely runs the pipeline and it does the communications with welfare re benefits recipients, um, has enormous IT, one of the longest and largest, it might be the largest um, uh, IT user in the Southern Hemisphere, for example. Um, uh, it's been doing this for a long time, since the, uh, since the 60s. It, of necessity, has a focus on waste management, errors, and fraud, because there's a huge amount of money flows through this, uh, this pipeline. Um, the uh, individual clients, at least in some programs, have a responsibility to report every fortnight what income they've had, because many people have modest levels of income from other sources, but are still supported uh, through the welfare system. And for many, many years, uh, the data has been matched against the taxation authority, uh, obviously in retrospect, because taxation is an annual in arrears uh, mechanism, possibly changing slowly, but it's still at that point um, right now. And the organization, of course, has been listening to all those consultants and IT um, uh, uh, suppliers who have argued that IT has enormous transformative potential, um, and therefore you should be doing much more dynamic things with, with IT. So that was the context in which, in 2015, RoboDebt was dreamt up. It was called a different name by the department, obviously, uh, but uh, we will keep calling it RoboDebt. What they did was to average tax data to fortnights, which um, had been done for a long, long time internally um, in order to uh, identify prospective clients who might um, have been involved in error or who may be committing fraud. And subject to human checking, which has always been the case in the past, uh, it has a role to play and it does identify uh, some cases of error and some cases of fraud. It was now to be done in an automated manner. Material differences were to be assumed to be evidence of overpayment and letters of demand were to be sent to clients, not for money, but please explain. And if you don't explain, then we will raise a debt. Uh, so quite, uh, quite strong uh, letters of demand were sent and they were, this was done in an automated manner. So this is automated action um, uh, being done, not just inferencing decision-making. Uh, it just in the process inverted the onus of proof, so the department no longer had to prove a debt. Uh, the department assumed a debt and just went plonk, it's up to you, client. If you can show us we're wrong, then we'll change our mind, otherwise we're doing it. Um, and the demand for evidence was extraordinary. Um, it asked for um, uh, detailed data. Um, there was a case, in fact, in front of the Royal Commission just in the last two days. Uh, where evidence was provided that um, something like 50 to 70 pages had to be faxed by one individual. And even then the department wasn't satisfied and changed their mind and said, no, 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 we, we don't want those pay slips. We want your bank statements instead. So another 50 to 70 pages had to be sent. And it was all about the, to most people, distant past. And what's more, there's even an advice from the department saying you only have to keep your evidence for six months. Uh, extraordinary what, uh, what the department imposed. Um, and debts were raised and debt collection was undertaken. And the outcomes were a million letters were sent over the three year life of this, uh, of this uh, process. Um, many of those clients were issued with debt notices um, and many of those who were issued with debt notices, they were actually pursued um, and quite a lot of money did flow back into the department. Um, at no stage was solid evidence available as to uh, what the uh, department uh, was working from. So the individual clients and their advocates, counsellors, lawyers were unable to get solid data evidencing the debt. Uh, it was obviously untenable. Um, uh, leave aside the law. It was obviously an unreasonable thing to do um, uh, by December 2016. It only took two or three months and it was abundantly uh, clear in the media. Um, uh, all the public knew this was crazy. Uh, it continued for another three years. Uh, enormous harm was done to users. Uh, the clients, um, we can talk about socioeconomic levels of people, we can talk about literacy levels of people, particularly bureaucratic literacy of people. Um, by definition, they're not big, big money earners. Um, and uh, uh, UZs as well, because there's a range of people who were impacted who were not themselves users of this system. Uh, it's still being unwound and it's in front of a Royal Commission right now. One quick observation here in terms of categories of UZs, 
dependents were affected, householders who were not dependent on social welfare clients were affected because they had a very, very worried person or multiple individuals in the household were very, very worried and feeding their worry off one another. Uh, there were carers of disability pensioners involved. There were mothers of people who quite literally suicided as a result of receiving these notices, or one has to be careful and say shortly after receiving a, a notice of this kind. Um, Councillors were affected because the uh, number of people seeking counselling uh, changed uh, and the information available was too limited and lawyers were having to handle cases in large numbers um, and uh, relatively po very poorly paid lawyers in this case as well. Uh, so UZs were very much in play in this case. What we've done here is to uh, identify four different ways in which um, multi-stakeholder risk assessment could have been used. One is the strategic approach, approach whereby an organisation says, we're not going to do this at project level. We're going to look at this as an organisation and say, we deal with these people. We deal with them all the time in many different ways. We have lots of interventions that we come up with in order to try to improve this system, either to make it pay better or to make it uh, waste less money. Uh, we're doing this all the time. We need a reference group. Here's the kinds of organisations we need. Here's the background we need to have with them. Here's the information flows, the conversations we're going to have. And if we need to fly you to, a, to an important meeting, we'll bloody we'll do it because it's important. We know you don't have a lot of money. You guys are volunteers. Some of you guys are volunteers not, uh, uh, not paid to do these things. So that's one approach. And quite clearly, uh, MSRA uh, is, is absolutely mainstream for that. Let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Let's take an agency that is not interested in this, an agency, whoops, sorry, uh, I'll skip that one, haven't got time now, unfortunately, interesting though it is. Uh, let's look at an agency that says, no, they're barbarians, we do not want them in here. They will, they, they muck up our nice, uh, our nice carefully designed public service processes. We'd also be disclosing sensitive information to them, we don't want to do that. Uh, however, uh, since you asked us to, to do this, we will use a proxy. We just won't talk to the great unwashed. So we'll hire some consultants. Uh, I've done a number of jobs where I've been hired effectively as a proxy for stakeholders, trying to involve them, possibly permitted to talk to them myself, but uh, the client uh, themselves, the agency does not, uh, typically an agency, can be a corporation, doesn't want to talk to the stakeholder groups themselves. They don't mind if I do. That, that's, that's been my, my role on a number of occasions um, in, in jobs like this. Um, or staff members can role play, because they obviously know a fair bit about this. The compliance staff in that agency actually know an awful lot about the public, and they know how to sift out the ones where they really are suspicious of their motives and their behaviour, versus the ones where they say, nah, it looked like it for a while, but but now nah, we're satisfied, they're just they're just dumb, leave them alone, uh, they, there might have been some errors made, but, but that's not fraud. Uh, compliance people know about these things too. And then what you can do if you've got that information as a government agency uh, is to say, um, we can pre-plan for some possible contingencies here. We can sense that there could be some difficulties. We always were worried that this one might not fly. We might get some pushback um, and we can think our way into the sorts of things we might have to do quickly in the event that things blow up in our faces. And of course, we could take the view that we'll um, be the ostrich and uh, hide our heads in the sand and say, no, 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 we've got power, we'll do this. Uh, the government uh, was a big player, cabinet was a big player in this. Um, so we've got the government's support, the government's pushing us to do this, right, we'll do it anyway. We won't do any of this stupid multi-stakeholder risk assessment stuff in advance. But now that things are starting to happen, it's December 2016 and the public and the media are on our back, Perhaps we better turn the pages of that, uh, of that outline and just work out whether there's some things we should do quickly now. And obviously, a charm offensive to get the advocates in the door, make it feel as if uh, we're actually listening to them now and we'll have some summits, got to call it a summit, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll propose some design changes and mitigation measures, promise that they'll happen. Uh, it doesn't matter whether or not they do. What matters is that uh, we promise them so that uh, the advocates will get off our back. Even in this context, there could be some learning being done by the agency. Dreadful as this, um, as this abuse of um, multi-stakeholder risk, risk assessment is, it could have payback at least to the organisation, maybe to the individuals. Of course, what we're trying to do is to wean organisations across to a proactive approach to this. We want them to apply risk assessment of this kind in advance. We want them to identify relevant stakeholder reps, 
We want them to engage them, listen to them, assimilate the messages, <clears throat> and reflect advocates' input in what they do. I've got in brackets the cut down version, the, um, uh, the haven't really got my heart in it approach to this, uh, where the risk assessment is done um, in parallel rather than in advance. We, we pick and choose our stakeholder reps uh, in order to get the ones we know we can win over, like the ones we fund, for example. Um, we give them enough information, but not really the whole information and so forth. Even that cut down version is going to deliver a lot more than what we've got at the moment. So even a modestly cynical application of MSRA would help and a full bore proactive approach to applying MSRA would in this case, we can demonstrate, um, and we have in this, in this case study, demonstrated that uh, there's real value in this uh, for the public as a whole and indeed for the sponsoring organization, generalizing now beyond agencies to any sponsoring organization. So the conclusions that we've reached uh, almost exactly on my 45 minutes, I almost never make time, um, are that uh, impactful interventions need to be evaluated, not just deployed. Um, what a pity that uh, agency didn't listen. Um, there aren't many drivers for multi-stakeholder assessment, so we've got to come up with drivers if we're going to get this into effect. And we've got to make it as easy as possible for organisations to adopt this by making or encouraging them to adapt their existing processes rather than stage a revolution. Um, and one big thing that I haven't had time to stress up to now, the third of the emboldened paragraphs, in a lot of cases, the kinds of things that need to be done in terms of safeguards, mitigation measures and so on, design features, um, actually don't harm the agency's purpose. Um, they are just a case of, oh, well, actually, yes, hadn't thought of that. Yeah, okay, we could vary it a bit and still achieve our objectives. There's quite a lot of that can go on, uh, provided the insights are achieved by the organisation. And um, so this form of risk assessment is already familiar. Um, not a lot changes. There's some other people at the table some of the time in the process. We have some external meetings as well as internal meetings uh, on our risk assessment processes. So uh, we've got some evidence that uh, lots of benefits for all parties could have arisen from this uh, if only we had done it in this um, simulated case study. Uh, so um, I think it's a really good idea and I think you should absolutely love it. And now Katina is going to um, <clears throat> enlarge upon it and hopefully uh, our three uh, commentators are going to tear it apart and show me what we haven't got right yet. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you so much, Roger Clark. Uh, how wonderful to have you on today. Uh, you remind us so much of the importance of valuing stakeholders, not just the ones that matter to our back pocket, but all of them, particularly with that RoboDebt case study where the vulnerable communities were not consulted and perhaps should have been first and foremost. You call them users and UZs, and perhaps we can have a discussion on that in a moment. Additionally, I keep thinking about documentation that comes with risk assessment, whether we try to identify those things that we need to treat and respond to in our documentation when our feelers go out there that there could be something wrong, or we try to avoid and hide that particular risk and then sweep it under the carpet and then it comes back to bite us later. Or do we accept and own the risk and move forward after addressing it through documentation, through a continual process? But I keep thinking back based on what you said to who is the audience of the multi-stakeholder risk assessment and who is the sponsor and what is their motivation? Dr. Abbas always reminds me about why are we doing the risk assessment and who will it serve as a primary element? Is it for a service level agreement between multiple stakeholders? Is it for looking at mutually exclusive suppliers to a particular large scale system? Is it so that we can get a bank loan and get our bank loan approved uh, to spend maybe $500 million on a CDMA network as was done in Australia when Norto Networks won the bid and unfortunately went to gloom within three years of its deployment? So why are we doing it? Who are we trying to appease and are we in it for the right reason? Thank you so much, Katina. Thank you, Professor Roger Clark, again, for another thought provoking presentation. Roger, it's always a luxury to hear you speak and to share um, for you to share your wealth of experience with us. Uh, as Katina mentioned, you covered quite a lot of concepts there, many um, themes 
around socio-technical systems, stakeholder theory, and encouraging thinking beyond the user and the organisation to focus on UZs. And there's so much to unpack there, but in the interest of time, we will turn to our guest panel uh, for their reflections and questions. And as I mentioned earlier, we are joined today by Ms Yvonne Apollo, Dr Jordan Schrunner, and Associate Professor Rob Nichols. I'll first invite you, um, Yvonne, for your reflections. And just as you start to, to think about uh, Roger's talk and by way of introduction, um, uh, Yvonne Apollo is a lecturer in the School of Law at the University of Wollongong. She's a colleague and collaborator of mine, and she's designed and taught a number of core subjects within the law degree here at UOW, and um, things such as privacy, law and technology, um, taught law and contract law, foundations of law and introduction to law, and is part of numerous global challenges, um, projects that are at the intersection of privacy, law and technology. Um, in terms of research, Yvonne's expertise lie in the field of privacy law, where she interrogates the suitability of existing legal and regulatory frameworks to protect personal privacy and uphold Australia's obligations under international public law. And she's currently working, as I said, on numerous research projects, one of which is her PhD thesis that examines the future of privacy law in the context of rapid technological development. And it's on the basis of this work that Yvonne has been invited to participate in the consultation process for the Attorney General's Department um, or the Attorney General Department's ongoing review of the Privacy Act, um, the Federal Privacy Act. And it's over to you, Yvonne, for some reflections and perhaps some questions for Professor Roger Clark. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for that um, introduction, Roba, and it was wonderful to hear your um, proposal, Roger, to uh, change up, I guess, how um, the, the process of, 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 of implementing new socio-technical systems or, you know, trying to take the focus away from just looking at the business case um, and just focusing on economics and innovation and, and, and uh, you know, to the exclusion of, of all else. Um, I think that what you're, first of all, I, I guess I, I come from the perspective of, of course, law uh, and privacy law and trying to think about what more could be done there to actually address, you know, real world problems that we're experiencing. And we, um, we very much know that um, privacy law in Australia in particular is um, undercooked <laughs> uh, and struggling to keep pace. So the tool that you're suggesting seems to be a really useful way of bridging this gap, obviously not just in relation to privacy, but in relation to trying to embed a number of different values within socio-technical systems and um, trying to obviously take into account many different interests. So it seems as though this is a beneficial way of um, transcending the, this control paradigm that we have where we just place the burden on the individual user of a system to protect their own interests um, because now we're shifting that burden onto business itself to actually take into account multiple different interests. So I think that that is a useful tool. So about, you know, transcending that control paradigm and, yes, bridging the gap that we see between formal regulation and um, technological development and so it can operationalize a number of different um, values, dignitarian values, including obviously what I'm particularly interested in privacy and, and concepts of trust. And um, what you've said in relation to whether or not, or the extent to which these assessments are used is interesting. So you've mentioned that um, there are a number of different assessment tools uh, that businesses can already use. Um, however, they're not because of that primary obligation to shareholders. Um, so I guess I'm wondering the extent to which this tool, incorporating stakeholder voices, will be used when we still have that overriding obligation to um, to directors that sorry directors to shareholders. Um, on that note, I, I guess it brings to mind um, Jack. Balkan's proposal about the fidu a fiduciary model, where in America, he, in the context of America, he's suggesting that it's possible to use fiduciary law to actually say that although directors have that primary obligation to shareholders, they still 
have a fiduciary obligation to information, to the subjects of information. So I'm actually looking into that at the moment about whether fiduciary law in the context of Australian equity law could actually see that there is a fiduciary obligation to the subject of information as well as to um, director, uh, to shareholders. Anyway, so that's an interesting, so I guess one question is, well, how would um, this tool be taken up when we still have that overriding obligation to, um, to shareholders? And then an associated question, I guess, that comes to my mind and, and a little bit of scepticism in, um, in non-formal legal approaches to, to, to this sort of risk assessment is how can we ensure that all uh, 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 stakeholder voices are equally heard? Um, how can we overcome the asymmetries that exist, the power and information asymmetries between the different stakeholders if we're relying upon tools that are embedded in standards but aren't mandated by law? Um, for example, you know, we have the privacy impact assessment mandated at times in certain circumstances under the Privacy Act, but it tends to be used as just a mere compliance checklist list thing and not necessarily meaningfully taking into account um, various interests and, and risks. So, yeah, what is your thinking around how this tool might be used to a greater extent than others? Um, and can we overcome asymmetries in power and information within the stakeholder group without a mandate within formal law? Yeah, okay. No, there's some great questions there. A uh, couple of quick responses uh, on those, Yvonne. Uh, the um, um, the first one of the first points you made reminds me of the problem that we have that reasons for decisions do not have to be disclosed to to individuals uh, as, a, as a fundamental in law there's well there's just is an absence of law Sandra Wachter at uh, Oxford Internet Institute in the UK has been flogging this in the context of the GDPR uh, and that plays into this into the same space uh, because there was no sense of an obligation uh, by an agency to have to explain in advance uh, uh, while uh, while it was doing doing things it's uh, it's not a generic obligation it does exist here and there in bits of law but uh, but that is a bit of a gap and it's increasingly going to be a problematic gap when we are um, automating inferencing decisions and action so so that's a, a another one to add into your little basket that you've got there um Yes, the director's responsibilities would have to be a change in law and it'd have to be changed in statutory law because we can't wait for the courts to uh, to gradually adapt to societal values. Um, so yes, the Corporations Act is a, is a real blockage point. Personally, I'm um, a, a much stronger advocate for uh, LAW law. Um, uh, I've got to admit to having a, a bit of an interest in co-regulation in contexts in which there's um, significant um, technical content or significant um, um, complexity of machinery, if you like, institutional complexity, um, because then, um, uh, quite frankly, legislative drafts people are never going to be able to get it right. Um, and indeed, the design done in places like the Attorney General's Department will never be able to get it right. And that's not because they're fools, it's because it's too complicated and they don't, they don't have that detailed knowledge. So, so some level of statutory framework and then capital C codes um, negotiated with all players at the table are becoming power asymmetry um, uh, it, it does does have some attractions as well. It's just that we don't do it much, and we, we and we haven't got many uh, good examples of it. Uh, where the uh, fiduciary model, equity, uh, law, duty of care kinds of ideas come in, um, depending on the ponderous. Um, uh, progress uh, that's made in case law or common law, uh, we can't rely on that. There would have to be statutory intervention to uh, uh, to apply those principles. I don't see it happening anytime soon now. I think it's a very worthy thing to be to be researching and trying to generate momentum for. I'm not sure that you can achieve change. Well, I won't be nasty and say in your lifetime because you get a lot, a lot of it, but um, uh, certainly not in my lifetime. Uh, it's um, it's going to take an awful lot of pushing. Basically, the way I see it, Parliament isn't on the side of the weak. Uh, 
uh, Parliament is uh, subject to the same power plays and asymmetry um, of, of, of power and information, uh, and they listen much more to the um, to the big brigades than, than they do to the small time advocates. ACOS couldn't get in the door. The national peak body of social welfare for social welfare recipients could not get in the door and get a hearing with the body that is paying welfare recipients. <laughs> it's just an extraordinary element of the robo debt case study. Uh, but a lot of good points in there. Please keep doing it, uh, Yvonne. Thank you. And 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 just on that, the, the, uh, we have limited examples of um, co-regulatory approaches. And then even when they're proposed, it's interesting to see that advocates, for, for example, privacy advocates, push back on that. So we've got the <laughs> online privacy bill. Um, that has been that is suggesting the creation of an OP of an online privacy code that will be first developed by industry with consultation with the public. But you know, many submitters responded to that and said, as soon as you have industry involved in developing these codes, it's going to take time. They're going to find loopholes. Um, it's just going to be about um, emphas uh, emphasizing industry interests. Um, this is not what we want. So. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. The law is not changing quickly. We try to do it, take a co-regulatory approach, and there's pushback from 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 um, advocates. Yes, unfortunately, the uh, adversarial um, um, bug uh, has has caught uh, quite a lot of advocates. Um, I was a member of the core consultative group that uh, was supposed to be designing the 2000 amendments uh, to impose. Uh, um, uh, impose actual law on the private sector uh, and the attorney general and a bunch of mates uh, from five industry associations got together outside the core consultative group and wrote the act and uh, it was uh, absolutely debilitating for everybody in the room who wasn't among those five industry associations uh, it um, uh, so that there is an awful lot on um, scepticism uh, and outright cynicism uh, amongst advocacy organisations about the ability um, of the government to structure a genuinely balanced discussion. And therefore, I can understand the, uh, or, but not agree with, I can understand the attitude of some of them that they'd sooner not have uh, industry in the room. Um, it's just impractical. You must have all stakeholders in the room. It does not work otherwise, but you do have to balance out the uh, uh, balance out the uh, the impact and power of each uh, of each of those groups. Thank you, Roger. So much to talk about on that point, um, but I think I might hand over to Professor Joseph Kavalka, who's from the Yale Interdisciplinary Center for Bioethics. Um, there's a, some interesting comments about the US White House Office of Science and Technology Policies uh, blueprint for an AI Bill of Rights, just in the chat there, Roger, that you might wish to look, um, look at in a moment. But Joe, are you available to provide us with some reflections and, and perhaps talk to that point? Yeah, I just, uh, can you hear me all right? We can go ahead. Good. All right. <clears throat> Just wanted to mention that um, I was reading through a few days ago uh, the U.S. Um, initiative to trust AI, essentially, uh, which was issued by the Office of uh, of uh, Science and Technology at the White House, um, and they talked specifically about engaging stakeholders, experts, and the public. Uh, and what they're writing, what they've written, and I'll just read it because it's easier to give it verbatim, uh, in order to better understand the challenges and opportunities to advance trustworthy AI, the federal government has led a number of engagements about AI with the public. Uh, OSTP, which is the Office of Science and Technology at the White House, issued a request for information alongside two listening sessions to hear from the public on the topic of AI enabled uh, technologies. The RFI received 130 responses from the public uh, OSTP also issued an RFI on advanced privacy enhancing in order to help inform the national strategy. Uh, as part of the AI risk management framework um, uh, was issued um, an RFI that received 106 responses from the public, which were then used to inform the workshop with over 800 participants. Um, so a longer list of AI related RFIs can be found, you know, uh, in this publication I'm reading from. Uh, which is the AF, uh, the AI initiative, but it, it appears as if finally, uh, frankly, uh, the, uh, the US is uh, trying to get on top of this and they're actually doing something and they seem to be doing it uh, for all 
when it, in comparison to other things the government does at lightning speed. So let's keep our fingers crossed. But they seem to have a, you know, a, a, a real uh, conversation going here, especially when you consider that, you know, they get uh, 800 participants uh, uh, in a workshop, all basically speaking to engaging stakeholders, experts in the public. Thanks, Joseph. Um, I'll say my negative reaction first and then my positive one. Um, the work that I did on the responsible AI area came up with a list of 50 principles. Uh, and uh, the ability, although I did manage to um, put some headlines on those and get it down to 10 groups, it was extremely difficult. There are just so many elements to it. So my first scepticism about the EU's uh, approach now the, uh, uh, the one that we've got out of the uh, US White House, uh, my scepticism is about the thinness uh, of these sets of principles that's, uh, that are being applied. But to switch to the positive side of it, those words in there uh, about consultation, it's not, it's not quite um, the somewhat theoretical word of um, um, uh, uh, asymmetry and symmetry, but uh, it's, uh, that, that's a very positive bit uh, I've, I've highlighted uh, in blue in, uh, on my screen. Um, and the testing, I'd like to see the testing that they're talking about um, drawn back to the design phase as well and make clear that the design and the testing must reflect the outcomes of those consultation processes. So I can quibble a bit, but gee, there's a lot, a lot positive in principle one. Uh, so, and that is, I've got to say, much more interesting reading and much more useful reading than a lot of the things we've we've seen come out of White Houses and all the other places around the world. Uh, so yes, that's progress. Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Joe and Roger, for those comments. And Yvonne, um, thank you once again. I'm sure you have much more to, to share with us and we can pick that up offline. I think I might move on to our next panellist. So next we'll be hearing from Dr. Jordan Richard Schuner. Um, Dr. Schuner is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Concordia University and an adjunct research professor in the Department of Psychology and a member of the Institute for Data Science at Carleton University. He's also the former ARL Research Fellow at the Army Cyber Institute Institute in the US Military Academy, and his research concerns the cognitive and social dimensions of decision making and learning. Um, applications include um, uh, to technology include trust in artificial uh, agents, social norms of cybersecurity, psychology dimensions of explainable AI, and research and data integrity. So I'm sure we've got a lot to say here. He, um, uh, Jordan, um, he's also the author of an excellent book um, titled Artif uh, Ethical Artificial Intelligence from Popular to Cognitive Science, Trust in the Age of Entanglement, and he's also a contributor to the Center for AI and Digital Policies 2022 Artificial Intelligence and Democratic Values Index. So um, welcome Dr. Shuna to our colloquium and we invite you to share your reflections and questions with Professor Clark. You're excellent, thank you. Yeah. Um... Uh, there's a number of things I, I really like about what you've said. I mean, my concern being principally a cognitive psychologist is trying to understand how people perceive a situation. I mean, I started off uh, and look at very basic phenomena like low level perception of you know, discriminating lines and sounds, what have you. Uh, but, you know, speaking to your earlier point, uh, one of the things that interests me is the, the underlying dimensions of risk perception. And, uh, you know, I was really taken by your point that we need to understand those objective dimensions because uh, that's really what's relevant here we can identify the objective dimensions as much as we like but unless uh, you know stakeholders actually can identify them themselves it creates vulnerabilities in the use of these technologies um, uh, so with respect to that uh, what do you think are some of the ways we can then engage uh, stakeholders to ensure that we capture not only how they perceive things but help maybe foster an understanding in them Mm. The, I do address that at one point um, uh, in some of what I've written. I don't think I've got it covered in the slide. Um, the authenticity is something that advocacy organisations can bring. I've, I've often been in this situation where I've had to explain myself to a parliamentary committee, do I represent a particular um, part of the segment of society when I'm arguing for consumer rights or more commonly uh, privacy uh, interests. And my explanation always has to be, I'm not representing anybody. I'm presenting a line of argument based on evidence and analysis. Um, and um, 
my weakness is that I can't speak authentically on behalf of, say, um, a social welfare earner. I don't know as many of them as I know of people who are well off my age and 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 have, and have got uh, nice stuff sitting behind me in my, in my dining room. Um, so getting advocacy groups which are representative and which do have people on the ground um, and uh, which do have a real sense of how those particular segments uh, perceive things, who can bring anecdotes, who can sub-segment the areas and say, well, what you've missed out is the person who is both a disability pensioner and does have some low-level employment uh, and does have a dependent. You've missed out the insights um, because you haven't thought of one of those, have you, before? Now, I've made up that example, but um, but it is one that's concerned me uh, on one of the, sl uh, the slides that I skipped over. Um, I listed the breakdown of about 10 different categories of, of advocates for users and users who presented at the parliamentary committee on, the, on robo debt. There were 62 organizations and when you categorize them they uh, I, I brought them down to about those 10 categories so there's um, that that authentic voice is is one of the most critical tests i don't believe that going out and doing the vox populi thing and asking people on the street and talking to individuals is going to deliver you all of what you need i'm not saying for a moment don't do it because they are ultimately the authentic voices but they're far less likely to have thought deeply into it they'll only have a limited experiential base uh, to work from so complementing individual voices with with uh, appropriate advocacy organizations and enough enough uh, richness of advocacy organizations is to me the only way that uh, that these um, uh, these organizations can do it in the only way that governmental um, um, refereeing organizations uh, uh, can possibly do it. It's, it's a hard one. I have done an amount of this in my consultancy work and, and, uh, and getting a balance, getting, for, for instance, five advocacy groups into a room on a privacy matter relating to uh, voice authentication. So early biometric uh, use for authentication, not identity not identification, it was about 15 years ago, uh, um, uh, getting it down to five <laughs> and the right five so there was a balance amongst them and they covered enough of the segments and enough of the technical and the legal uh, perspectives was quite a challenge. Yeah, in my case, my concern, uh, so in Canada, just uh, to provide some context, because I know Canada usually gets ignored, uh, but uh, we've just had uh, the first reading of what we call Bill uh, C-27, which is what we call the Digital Charter Implementation Act. So it's, in a sense, we're, we're a little bit ahead of what the White House is attempting to accomplish. It attempts to integrate three different uh, bills that uh, address certain points. So we have the Consumer Privacy Protection Act, uh, the Personal Information and Data Protection Tribunal Act, and finally, the most recent one, which is the Artificial Intelligence and Data Act. And so all of this is, in fact, you know, predicated on the idea uh, that, you know, we're trying to empower uh, users or, uh, you know, more generally data subjects, because people may not be actually, as you mentioned before, using the systems per se, but they are used by the system in the sense they have this information. And so very much following the lead of uh, GDPR, uh, people have the right to access their information, have the right to correction. Uh, I don't know if I've seen the right to deletion yet, but I've only really started going through some of the, the fine grained text of the bill. But to my mind, even, you know, and I think some of your talk speaks to this, uh, my concern still rests, again, in the domain of psychology, which is this notion of valid consent. And, you know, we can be advocates as much as we want, but in the end, people need to understand what is being used with their technology. And that requires some type of technological literacy that I don't think exists yet. Um, and I really think it's the case where we need to start, you know, radically changing our educational programs uh, to the extent that we can address some of these issues. Uh, and some of my own research, again, I look at the more, you know, abstract empirical side. I present people with, you know, technological categories and human categories, and I get them to rate them on various dimensions of trust. So perceived competency, perceived warmth, et cetera. And one of the findings that you might find shocking is uh, smartphones are rated to be more highly competent and warm than most human categories, and they're on a par with dogs. So really here, we're looking at quite literally domesticated technologies where people are they're used to them, they're familiar with them. And as a consequence, that creates a vulnerability because they're not entirely certain what they're doing with their data. It's going off into the cloud and it's potentially being used. And you know, over the years, I talked to my students about this and, and they seem to be relatively unconcerned about this. And I can draw parallels with another line of research that I started conducting at West Point, which is this idea of, of an insider threat in an organization. Uh, when I came across that uh, notion, 
I was somewhat shocked because it's from the perspective of an organization. Anyone that you know does something that is counter to the organization's uh, you know motives is all of a sudden categorized as an insider threat. And one of the things I try to do in my research is differentiate unintentional insider threats. Uh, from intentional ones. Intentional ones are essentially done based on people's own motivations for their personal gain or to retaliate, et cetera. But the unintentional ones I find are much more fascinating and likely much more common and driven by individual differences. So you see low levels of conscientiousness. Uh, that personality trait is associated with higher levels of, uh, you know, failing to change your password, uh, failing to be aware of network security policies, but things like high anxiety as well. That's associated with uh, unintentional disclosure online. But concurrently, you actually see high levels of fear actually associated with more protective behaviors. People are less likely to download unknown files and less likely to, uh, to fall prey to phishing schemes. So I, I guess what I'm saying here is I, I'm really interested in seeing what you know, organizations, whether they're governmental or non-governmental, are going to do to, to try to capture uh, some of those you know, real dimensions that are affecting people's uh, you know, risk perception. You know, going back to my first point, we know risk perception is, is, is a multidimensional construct. It's not a singular construct. And that then leads to a number of, uh, uh, of different points that I really think we need to think more clearly about when we're uh, you know, developing policies and guidelines. Yeah, so first to your, um, uh, your point there about uh, unintentional versus intentional insider threat in security terms, um, there is a real need for those organisations to distinguish between threat and vulnerability. Um, there is absolutely no doubt that an untrained person who is going to succumb to a simple phishing um, uh, email is a vulnerability. They're not themselves a threat. The threat is the uh, is, is is the phishing is, is the ability of that phishing uh, email to get through uh, and land in the mailbox and be clickable. That, that, that's um, uh, that's that's the threat. The vulnerability is the dumb person. Uh, dumb is the wrong word. The insufficiently trained, insufficiently aware, insufficiently awake because they haven't had their morning coffee. Person uh, that is the vulnerability. There are certainly also insider threats. Um, uh, that's uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a that's one I haven't thought about before. Coming back to your more general point. Um, I'm, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. You've made you, you've made the point really, uh, really clearly already. But I'll, I'll flog the word complementary. Um, complementary. Uh, we need each of. Uh, let me take again the uh, case in Australia uh, with robo debt. One individual case brought by one one person with the assistance of a lawyer, uh, of course, uh, 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 managed to actually change the tide. It actually forced the government to stop. It didn't force the government to fix what, what they stuffed up, but it forced them to stop. Um, so there was an instance where this wasn't a privacy-based matter. This was a, uh, the raising of a debt. So it was established, uh, established law. Um, uh, so an individual case could be brought. So empowerment of the individual was an important element of it. The next one that went through the court, which finally blew it out of the water, was a class action. So that second prong was absolutely crucial in this specific case of, of robo-debt. And there is still one looming in the background, which we don't get to do in Australia at any rate, which is to have a proxy, a representative or advocacy organisation bring a case and say, as a matter of principle, dear judge, we believe you should consider this matter. Now, this is a fairly foreign thing in, um, in British originated uh, court systems, I gather. Um, I'm a, a very, very fringe lawyer with a very, very narrow base. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, but, but each of those elements, I believe, needs to be in place. Uh, all of them have their benefits. All of them have their inadequacies as well. And floods of individual cases and floods of class actions aren't a good thing either. Uh, we need to have a little bit of a control of the throttle here but um but we uh we need each of those elements because they each address um different aspects different different depths um uh, different depth of, uh, of challenge can can be addressed by each of those so we need we need each of them but i'm certainly supportive of the idea that individuals must continue to have a role in this we mustn't ever get to the stage where consent is regarded as being just too hard and therefore uh, dispense with it and rely entirely on, on legislated authorities. No, um, we have got to have uh, consent components and we've got to have people uh, still able to take responsibility for their lives. Think the German sense of self-determination. Um, uh, we, we've got to uh, we've got to retain that in there, and we've got to empower people and encourage people to understand and think about it. And if they wish to sell their privacy for their loyalty points for five cents, 
that ultimately has to be their decision as long as they've had the opportunity uh, to inform themselves and, and to make the decision. We, we need each of the elements. So I've, I've gone a bit tangentially away from you. I'm sorry. You made your point very well. Thanks. Well, I, I agree with you entirely. I mean, the last thing I would say on that too is, uh, I mean, I don't think people are really aware of what data aggregation does to their data and how, how it can be traded as a commodity beyond that. You know, your, your, your last point about, you know, selling your privacy for rewards, that's fantastic because people might do that initially, but there's only a reasonable expectation that that organization would use their data and they probably would not foresee that that organization would sell it to yet another and that it could be aggregated and those individual identifiers could link them across. And I don't think anyone has that expectation. In, in, in psychology, we call this like the vividness effect. You can talk to people about statistics, but they want one concrete example. And for my students, I use this instance of, I think it's New York Times ran a piece in 2018 or something where they, they bought this, you know, aggregated data set. It was supposed to be, you know, anonymized or, or uh, and they were able to identify this one woman based on her GPS use and her idiosyncratic day-to-day -day behavior and they were able to contact her. And so they wrote a whole piece on what she did on a day-to-day -day basis. And for my students, that's what lands the message home. Mm. You could be this one data point in you know, millions of data points and yet they can still identify you based on your idiosyncrasies, especially in the West where we're concerned with individualism, that speaks to their concerns. Anyways, that's it. Thank you very much yeah. for your talk again. Thank you, Dr. Shana and Professor Clark for those comments and that really interesting discussion about valid consent. I think tech literacy is something we need to spend some time talking about in greater detail, the idea of threat versus vulnerability. And, and um, uh, for anyone who's interested, we popped in the chat a, a piece written by Dr. Shuna in the IEEE Transactions on Technology and Society, which we um, really encourage you to read about insider threats and individual differences um, uh, among um, Jordan's other work. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, in the interest of time, we will move on to our final panelist for today, Dr. Rob Nichols. Um, Dr. Nichols is an Associate Professor in Regulation and Governance at the University of New South Wales Business School in Sydney. He researches competition policy, the regulation of networked industries in the financial services sector with an emphasis on the effects of technology in the regulatory space. And Rob is also a visiting professorial fellow at the University of Technology, Sydney um, Law School. Uh, before moving to academia, uh, Rob had a 30 year career including working for law firms and the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission. And Dr. Nichols is also an accredited mediator and from 2012 to 2020 was Australia's independent telecommunications adjudicator. We're delighted to have you here, Rob, and the floor is yours for some reflections and questions. Thanks very much, Rob. Uh, and thanks very much to Roger for a, a really interesting and engaging presentation that raised a number of critical issues. You, you gave the uh, example of environmental impact statements. I actually think one area where MSRA could be applied and definitely is not is in regulatory impact assessments and the associated regulatory impact statements. These are conducted on a global basis and globally not terribly well. Um, you provided a very bright line on director's duties. I, I think actually there's a bit of a change occurring and especially in the context of environmental and social and governance issues or ESG issues in respect of director's duties. That is the interrelationship between uh, the social license for the business to operate and shareholder wealth maximization obligations are already in some tension. And issues such as climate change risk need to be taken on by directors under existing LAW law. Um, one of the issues I think with risk assessment is that that normal thing of likelihood and consequences followed by risk management, as you say, is that different stakeholders have very different views as to both likelihood and consequences. Now, you, you've proposed a parallel risk assessment. I, I'm not sure that that uh, parallel approach is as efficient as it could be. You know, actually, it, there is a benefit, I think, to be had from stakeholders understanding each other and each other's perspective on risk. And that means that in some contexts, an alternative approach might be to consider co-design. This is an area that 
uh, Katina, Rover and I are very interested in. And, and your robo-debt MSRA proposal looks a bit like co-design. Co-design is quite sensible because it has a, a built-in mechanism to deal with information asymmetries. And that might address some of the issues that were raised by Yvonne in her reflections, as well as Joseph's question. But importantly, rather than the example that Joseph gave of a listening session, co-design is a more involving approach. It also addresses potentially that issue of authenticity that you mentioned, Roger. So what's co-design? Well, broadly having the, the risk in this context, having the risk design being completed by the business, the business and stakeholders together. And why does it work? Well, actually, if you involve your stakeholders in design decisions, it's very hard for, from a business perspective, for the stakeholders to then say, well, that's a really appalling decision, even though I was part of making it. So it does have the, a, a benefit there. That overcomes some of the co-regulation issues, which are very real and which Yvonne mentioned in the privacy context. Um, does it work or well, where does it work? It, it works in health, it works in energy regulation, in water regulation, some Australian, Scottish and US energy tariffs were actually co-designed by regulated energy companies and public interest advocates. So that leads me to two questions for you. Um, the first one, does the concept of social license mean that businesses should consider MSRA as part of maximizing shareholder wealth? And the second is, could co-design be a mechanism for conducting the risk assessment and potentially be the basis for the participation in risk management uh, that you were much less optimistic about? Yeah, good questions, Rob, as I'd have expected. Um, let me go to the first, the earlier point you were making about uh, director's duties in environmental and social governance. Um, I'm, I'm not practicing on large commercial boards. The only uh, boards I'm involved with are association, not for profit uh, boards at the moment. Um, but I don't see much impact of that on me as a director, and I don't see much impact of that. Um, so if I'm sitting there as a board member, um, I don't feel I can shift to the left wing and explain to my fellow directors that the world's changed, fellas. We've got to get this environmental and social stuff balanced properly. Um, I don't see myself in a position to be able to do that. The climate change thing, uh, if I was sitting there in the major in a major boardroom, the concern about climate change in the room would be, um, has the organisation demonstrated that it is adapted sufficiently that the shareholder value will not be impacted? There are two sources of impact. Uh, climate change could absolutely stuff up our operations, change our markets, reduce our market share. Um, and the other is that we could be seen as such a pariah that um, customers will walk away from us and investors will be less interested in lending us money. They're the only two ways in which I could see it if I was sitting there on a major board right now. I'm not denying your points about ESG and, and uh, the importance of social contract, social license. I don't see it having great traction in boardrooms. And that's the similar sentiment that I bring to the... Uh, your point about parallel um, isn't efficient and integrated um, uh, perspectives would be much more effective and efficient uh, because everybody would be at the table listening to one another. Um, uh, we're probably a virtual table the way things have gone these days, but but at least we'd be uh, we'd have some touching points. Um, I I look at hard nosed board members and I look at hard nosed senior executives, and I don't see uh, much more readiness for participative design or co-design now than I've seen over the last 30 or 40 years. It's very hard to get social and, would you believe, even environmental discussions going in those contexts. Um, the contexts are all about uh, we've got um, revenue flows, we're using it for particular purposes, for the benefits of ICT industry and professionals, and we want to make sure we keep doing that. That's, that's the dominant 
um, perspective. So even at that end of the spectrum, I don't see um, uh, the notion of participation and co-design as uh, sneaking in there. So I'm delighted if you're right, <laughs> but I, I'm worried the thing I wrote down was, could we achieve breakthrough with an MSRA diagram that had integrated those four things out of the right wing? Um, well, I was on the right wing. That was a silly place to put it. Um, uh, 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 that, that, those breakout parallelisms, if, if those had been inside uh, columns rather than outside columns, uh, could we achieve the breakthrough with that? It would be less adaptive and more revolutionary. So I, I ran away from it, and I, and I, and I did it in the uh, uh, as as incremental a manner as I could. Um, so I can't say you're wrong. I hope you're right. <laughs> Please get out there and do it. Thanks very much, Roger. Thank you, Rob. Any final words from you? Um, just as we're Coming now I'm to going time. to throw, throw back immediately to you because I see the time. Oh, thank you. And, and I love the question you asked, Rob. I'm not sure. I think I have a response to some of the co-design stuff, Roger, which we might need to talk at, about at a later time. I see Katina laughing there when you said you're not quite so sure about co-design. As um, Katina, Rob and I have invested quite a lot of time and energy into that concept. So further discussion, we very much welcome on that specific point. Unfortunately, that brings us though to the end of the session. We would like to thank you, Professor Roger Clark, for contributing to the fourth series of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium. We wish we had a lot more time to continue and further this discussion. Uh, we'd also like to thank our wonderful guest panelists for joining us today and sharing their reflections, their questions, their expertise. Just so much to unpack there in each of your respective reflections. Thank you, Ms. Yvonne Apollo, Dr. Jordan Schuner, and Associate Professor Rob Nichols. And to our live attendees, we welcome further discussion. Thank you, Professor Joseph Kavalka, for your reflections today. And we welcome your attendance for all of you at the next session. And before we close, um, if you would like to revisit this talk and other presentations in Series 4 and the previous series of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium, the recordings will be made available on the ASU School for the Future of Innovation in Society YouTube channel channel and also on IEEE TV. And as always, my gratitude to Melissa Waite, who's been working very hard in the background, and to my co-host, Professor Katina Michael, for your support and reflections. We look forward to seeing you in the next session of Series 4 of the Public Interest Technology Colloquium, and thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks. Thank you very much.